All right, with that, um, I am really honored to introduce our next speaker. We have got Julie Ask here from Forrester as our morning keynote. Julie's a VP and principal analyst at Forrester Research and the author of The Mobile Mind Shift. It's a great book. I highly recommend you read it if you had it. And to be honest, Julie is one of our favorite analysts, so we're super, super excited to have her. Please join me and give me a warm Chicago welcome to Julie Ask. So good morning. All right, old-fashioned technology still works. It's good. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the future of the digital customer experience. And as I get started here, I'm going to see if this video works. I feel that we now, in the 21st century, we take technology for granted. Well, yeah, because now we live in an, in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the, on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots <laughs> that don't care, because this is what people are like now. They got their phone, and they're like... Uh, it won't. Give it a second. <laughs> give it, it's going to space. Can you give it a second to get back from space? Is the speed of light too slow? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say, actually, I have no idea who that comedian is, and because I, I like live in a cave or something, apparently. But I love that video because when I started in mobile in the late 80s, mobile was satellite communications. I worked in R&D and satellite communications. And I actually um, didn't move out to California until the end of 99 because I wanted to do this thing called mobile. And in uh, early 2000, I joined a startup that was already thinking about using context to make services more relevant for consumers on mobile devices. And that brings me to where I am today. I've been at this for, it seems like a long time at this point. So before I do, so you'll notice that as I talk about this, there's a little bit of a mobile story that flows through. So what we wanted to talk about a little bit today is how has mobile changed customer engagement paradigms, right? I think, you know, one of the things that we know today is that things are changing so fast and mobile is changing your customer expectations so fast. You know, what does that mean to you and what does that mean to how you engage? Because really, you know, the generation today really is impatient, even though it has to go to space and back. Uh, how are companies approaching mobile today, and why do they fall short? And then what are some of the key trends that are going to impact the, the future of mobile engagement or really digital experiences more broadly? I don't mean to use mobile. Sorry, there's a poll here. I don't mean to ignore all of you back there. The, um, I don't mean to make mobile synonymous with digital, but really mobile is the catalyst for digital experiences today. Mobile doesn't have to be on a mobile phone, but if it isn't on a mobile phone, it's the pure scale of the mobile, the, the smartphone industry that is making sensors and radios and chips and all the other things that go into a product like the Echo affordable to consumers. So I really do believe it is the driving force. Okay. So, all right, let's uh, jump in the phone. So one of the things we think about historically is that companies have had all of the power. And I'll just go back in time a little bit. If we think back to the late 1800s, about two-thirds of Americans were living on farms. And they had no choice of what to buy, where to buy it, or how much they were going to pay, because there was only one place they could go shop, which was at the local store. In the late, I think it was about the late 1880s, this guy named Sears from this part of the country started shipping these things called catalogs out to people who lived on farms, and he used trains to ship the products to them. And so suddenly, consumers had choice of product, right? There was more things that they could buy. Along come the 1920s and this technology called cars come along. Americans move into cities, and now we can drive around to different stores. And so we have a choice of not only what we want to buy, but where we want to buy it, right? Along comes the internet in the 1990s, and a company called Amazon comes along. And now we have the choice of like not only what we want to buy and where we want to buy it, but there's a lot of pricing transparency. Fast forward to about the year 2010, which is when this tip happened, and technology, and very specifically mobile technology, has now given consumers the power. Because now I'm taking all of this information that I have, and I'm taking it into the stores where I'm shopping. I'm taking it into the airport. I have it in the bank. Not only can I take this information with me, but my switching costs are so low. Right? If I don't, if, the, it, you know, according to, uh, his name's T.K. Lewis or something, I think, right? Let me see, right, exactly. Um, there were not computers when I was 10 years old. Those came out when I was like 20. 
so <laughs> I'm dating myself. But um, so with phones, right, so if I don't like, right, if it's not moving fast enough for me, and if the experience I'm getting isn't good enough, do you know what 21% of consumers do? They just download another app that does the same thing, right? That's how fast and how easy it is for consumers to switch today, right? I can do that in 60 seconds. Um, and so that's where we get when we start thinking about this notion of mobile phones. We pull out our mobile phones probably 150 to 200 times a day to get something, to do something, to make something happen, to glance at something, right? And if you go back to the, um, well, actually, so this is something that we call a mobile moment, right? It's a point in time and space, right, when I pull out a mobile device to get something that I need immediately in context. A lot of these mobile moments are on phones today, but they're also going to be on connected products and robots and all around us. But if we go back to that customer journey, as you're thinking about serving your customers, that's the expectation that I have, whether I'm doing research or I'm making a purchase or I've actually got a product and it's at home, I'm pulling out my phone, right, 150 or 200 times a day. But if you thought about what that means, even here in the US, there are more than 200 million smartphones in the United States today, more than 200 million. And even if we take a conservative number and do some simple math and say we each pick up or look at our mobile phones 150 times a day, right? Think about the volume, the sheer number of engagements and the opportunities that you have to engage with your customer in any given day. When you do that math, I'll tell you what the answer is. 30 billion, 30 billion mobile moments or 30 billion of these digital interactions every day where you have the opportunity to engage with your customer. It's a lot. Right? You can't do that without the technology and the infrastructure services and the analytics that Jay talked about. It's very, very hard to do. And if you're thinking, gosh, I don't know if I'm ready to interact with my customers in those 30 billion mobile moments a day. Certainly you don't own all of them. You know, most companies would think, well, gosh, like I'm standing at the edge of this precipice. Like, how do I get to the other side? There's no roads. There's no signs. Very few other companies have done it. And if you feel that way, then you're probably in good company because only 4%, yeah, 4% of the companies that we've surveyed have the organization and the infrastructure and the talent and the spend to meet these, what we call these shifted expectations of your customers and use context and anticipate what they need and win, serve, and retain your customers in these mobile moments. It's very, very hard to do. Because there's challenges, right? And let me talk about what some of those challenges are. I'll tell you I like to take photos too. So the first thing that a lot of companies do is they treat mobile as a channel. And I like to use this photograph of, and like I said, I like to take photos, but this is my old iPhone and it's peering into a mirror and my phone is very sad. And why is my phone sad? Because it's being treated like a computer, right? So many companies, in fact, 62% of companies have taken experiences that have been designed for the PC and simply like squeeze them and shrunk them down onto a small screen. Yeah, that's what most companies, how most companies are treating mobile today. And when you do that, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? That's an okay experience. You know what? It is an okay experience, but the needs and motivations that I have as a consumer or as an employee on the go are very different than the needs and motivations that I have while I'm sitting at home in front of a PC, right? So as my needs and motivations change, so does what you serve me with. That also has to change, and you can't do that if you put the same experience on every device, right? Same thing goes for things like the smartwatch, right? We don't want to take experiences we've designed for the mobile phone, put them into the washing machine, and put them into the dryer, and shrink them down one more time, right? That's not going to work. Also, if we treat the mobile phone or a smartwatch or whatever the next device is, like something old, uh, my colleague James McQuivy has this great quote where he says, when brands or consumers first adopt new technologies, they tend to do old things in new ways. And it's not until they really internalize technology that they start thinking about the net new things that they can do, right? And that's what disruptors in the market are doing today. The second challenge that companies have is they think an app is a strategy. Right? An app is not a strategy, and it's not the kind of the be-all, end-all. I took this, I don't know, like five years ago, right, of my cat peering into a fishbowl. 
right? Uh, whether it's a mobile phone or it's a smart watch or it's the next connected product that we have, these are not just shiny objects. They're not shiny objects that sit in the fishbowl to be admired that have no connection to your overall business. These are technologies that help you serve your customers throughout this customer journey that Jay described and help you win, serve, and retain them in those moments when they want to engage with you, right? It's not about having an app. It's about a technology that helps you better serve your customers. Right? So you can't treat mobile like it's just a project. Right? You have to build out that infrastructure stack that Jay referenced. I um, mean, you have to create a strategy to transform your culture as well in three key ways. Well, let's do this quickly. One is Jay talked about this collaboration. I would tell you, as somebody who uh, has been an engineer in the past, but I have been working on the business side for the past 20 years, those of us who are business professionals are a large part of the problem today about why we can't deliver the kinds of experiences we want on mobile. As e-business professionals, as digital marketers, we have so desperately wanted to meet these ever-shifting expectations of our customers that we've taken like shortcuts, we've done projects, we've done everything we can to work around our technology counterparts who for the most part scare us because they speak in acronyms and they think beer apps are awesome, right? That's my colleagues at work. So, right, but we at a point now, like Jay said, where we have to work together, right? We can't have this division of like CIOs and CMOs. We have to jointly own this technology agenda or something that we call the BT agenda. The second cultural change we need is we need to build infrastructure. The number two reason that companies can't deliver the kinds of digital experiences that they want to today is that they lack the infrastructure services to do so. They simply can't get access to the data that they have do it in real time and serve it up to customers in the ways that they want to. Number one on the list is we don't have talent. Number two on the list is we don't have the infrastructure services that we need to deliver the experiences that we want. And then finally, right, we have to be more agile. This isn't about waterfall. This isn't about a, tw you know, a one or a two year plan. This is about small bets, moving fast, failing fast, learning and moving on. So cultural change has to take place. An app is not a strategy. Third mistake or challenge that brands have is they focus only on apps. And when we talk about those 150 or 200 moments that we have each day with our phones, like 60 to 70% of those are what we call glanceable. Right? That may be a push notification, it may be an audio signal, but apps are overkill. Like going into an app to get something or do something is overkill for a lot of the experiences that I need to have, whether it's just a piece of information I need or whatever it may be. And so when we think about this as what we call micro moments at Forrester, it could be a text message, it could be a, an audio signal, it could be a haptic signal that just tells me to walk left or to walk right. Same thing could be on my watch. Not everything has to be opening an app, logging in and getting something done as much as companies would like to see that happen so that you know, we can be tracked, so to speak, as consumers. So you have to think about right-sizing these interactions. Uh, the fourth thing is, is they fail to partner. All right, let me talk about what this means for a moment. When we look at how consumers use, in this case, their mobile devices, they have a very strong preference for using apps. Right? There, I know there's a lot of data out there that makes it very confusing. Well, is web more important or apps more important? I would tell you they're both very important. But if you look at the data here, what it says on the left hand side and right hand side is millennials prefer apps to webs almost four to one in terms of the time they spend in apps versus on the web. And with non-millennials, so those of us over the age of 35, it's about three to one. So the first takeaway here is yes, consumers use both, but the second thing is, is we prefer apps. Right. The next secret I will tell, share with you though, is while as adults we do spend most of our time inside of mobile apps, about 85% of that time within apps is in five or fewer apps. That's it. Five or fewer apps. And what you see here on the left hand side is if you're not Facebook and you're not Google and you're not Apple or you're not a major category le leader, you're competing for a small, that 15% of time on a consumer's phone. Shopping, retail category, that gets about 5% of consumer time on phones. And if you say, well, who is getting the time besides some of these big giants? It's things like instant messaging applications where the users of those apps, you can, it's hard to probably see on the right-hand side, are spending like 200 minutes a week in apps like WeChat and WhatsApp and KakaoTalk. That's where your customers are. 
Okay, so I will tell you, I'm an engineer. I'm not a designer. So this may be like the ugliest picture you have ever seen, but I haven't found a way to do this better, so bear with me. So most of us are operating in a paradigm today that's like on the left-hand side, all right, where consumers are downloading one app for every brand that they want to engage with. I counted, I think I have over 250 apps on my phone, okay? But what this thing is, is while I may have 250 apps on my phone, I'm spending 85% of my time in five apps. Five, all right? So if we look what's happening as consumers, I'm still gonna download apps from my favorite brands. I'm still gonna download an app from my bank. I can't fly United Airlines 100 times a year if I don't have their app on my phone. I'm still gonna download those apps. But another layer of platforms here from Facebook, Google, Instagram, Snapchat are going to disintermediate most brands. And if you're a brand and saying, you know, I need to engage with my consumers on this device, yeah, you're going to get some of your customers to download your app, but you have to think about how you're going to put content and services and then whatever the next thing is on top of these third-party platforms that own most of the mobile moments with your customers, right? You're going to have to think about what's my strategy for engaging with my customers when I don't own those mobile moments within my app. Just a few examples, we call this borrowing mobile moments. You see it with Facebook, ads in WeChat, or things like Yelp, where I just don't go in to get restaurant reviews, I can also go in and order food or order food for delivery. And you even can think about lending moments to others in your ecosystem, like United does with Uber, and Uber is doing with a lot of companies today, where we're, we share customers. Let's make it easier for our shared customers to get done what they want to get done. Let's not make them pop in and out of a bunch of individual apps. All right. And then finally, a lot of brands really lack a plan to drive ongoing engagement, right? I've built an app, my customers have downloaded it, I've paid one to three dollars to drive those downloads like it's a bottle in the ocean with a note in it, it's off. Not the case, right? You have to proactively engage your customers. Today, customers pull a lot of information from mobile phones, but as Jay was saying, increasingly these services like Google Now are completely shifting customer expectations where now your customers expect you to anticipate what they need and push it out to them in just that right moment. Um, and doing so really depends on having insights that you've developed from collecting data that allow you to go forward and do that. Okay. So let's talk about some of the key trends uh, that are bringing both new opportunities and threats into the market. All right. So this is, so there's five things here. The first one that I will tell you is context is still important. And I use the word still because this is a piece of research that I did about, I think, four or five years ago where we talked about how the progression of context would be the future of mobile services and we talked about how that would happen. If it helps you size things at all, in that lower left-hand corner it says something called using GPS or location to make your services more relevant to your customers, only one in four companies are able to do that today. So let me show you where things have progressed. So in the first stage of maturity, what we call for mobile, it's called the shrink and squeeze phase, right? That's my mobile phone looking into the mirror and feeling very, very sad. 44% of companies today still say that their primary approach to mobile and their skill set and their organization and so forth leave them with a strategy of shrinking and squeezing experience and jamming it onto a small screen. The second stage of maturity is what we call mobile first, which a lot of companies are pretty excited when they're like, yeah, we're mobile first. It's awesome, right? That's stage two at 42%, where they're doing some things to enhance the physical world, like having an in-store mode for a store. The third stage, and what we're really talking about being leading edge today, is where you're using mobile to transform a customer experience. You're doing things like ethnographic research and journey mapping and say, where can mobile or where can mobile moments somehow improve my overall experience? We have 14% of companies today that aspire to be in that space, uh, but only about 4% are really getting it done. And then when we look at the final stage of maturity, which is really about total business disruption, there's just a handful of companies that are in that space. You know, companies like Uber, and some others that have used mobile to completely upend the business model. And there's very few companies in that space, but we definitely expect to see more going in that direction. So that's about where we are. Context is still the future of mobile, but we're a little bit behind. All right, so the second trend I'll talk about is what mobile moments will be. So mobile phones are gonna move beyond phones to products, right? We talked about Alexa, we have smartwatches today, 
You probably have connected devices in your home, like your lights and your stereo and so forth. So mobile moments will be all around us, so to speak. They're going to shrink into what we call micro moments, so things like the text or the audio signal or the haptic signals. They're going to be dynamically assembled onto third-party platforms. I'm not going to go into one app like Yelp to get ratings and review, like a second app to make a reservation, or a third app to order food for delivery. It's all got to be within one integrated experience for me because that's what's convenient to me as a customer. And then finally, they're going to disappear into what they call virtual agents, so things like Google Now and the Echo products in Siri. New business models will disrupt. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through a lot of these, but I'll, uh, I'll choose a couple quick ones here. So one of the things we talk about is pricing based on the use of a product, not an expected use. And we, there's an example up here from the insurance industry. If anybody's in the insurance industry, you might say, well, yeah, but not every customer is going to do that. Not every customer is going to agree to be tracked so that they can be rated based on what their actual driving experience is. And I would say if you're thinking that, you're right. But who will choose to be tracked are the very best, most profitable customers that an insurance company has. And companies and disruptors like Metro Mile that charge me by the mile rather than on the fact that I'm a late 40s middle-aged woman living in San Francisco and owns an old car, right? Your best, most profitable customers will leave you from these business disruptors, right? But there's a lot of things that are going to give you new opportunities to price. Everybody's probably experienced surge pricing with Uber, right? That's just the beginning. Fourth, uh, data will rival audience in importance. We talked about the ownership of mobile moments with Facebook and Google owning so many of those moments. But data is the other half of the story. What you know about me, that context that helps you better serve me. So that data today and that contextual information falls into three big buckets for us. One is what we call situational context, which is my location or time of day or even information that you're getting from sensors as part of the broader internet of things. It's, oops, sorry about that. It's the, uh, I don't know if I can go backwards. I can't go backwards. It is the behavioral data, preferences that I've shared with you, things that you glean from social media, and the final category, which is really just starting to emerge now, is feelings. What you can infer from how I'm talking, my tone of voice, how I may look in a camera, but really the feelings, that context, and how do you use that to better serve customers. Oops, no, I'm still going backwards. OK. And then finally, it's you know software, and not really hardware, is going to bring the next generation of innovation here. When we talk about serving customers in their moments, and we talk about these connected products, whether they're robots or they're echoes or they're mobile phones, they have a huge data exhaust that comes off of them about where I am and what I'm doing and what my preferences are. And from that data, you have to be able to generate insights, understand your customers better, and then better serve them, like feature updates, software updates, <laughs> fixing bugs, and actually even layering services on top of these products. And with that, am I close to on time? Thank you, and I'll take some. I think we'll take questions for about five minutes. Thank you. Anybody have questions? Okay, I sped through the end, so somebody has to have a question. I left five minutes. So, with your example of uh, the disruptors that you had up there, the different companies, have you thought a bit about also the companies that are that are disrupting uh, industries that n no one would have really even imagined, like the Uber case that you had up there, uh, where you know it may, everybody thinks it's disrupting the taxis and the limos and all that with the medallion costs, and and that's all great, but are you not seeing also that also the the car manufacturers are seeing Uber as a threat as well potentially, where people start to decide. What do I need a car for? And a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, city type life uh, areas, uh, you know, uh, don't are get cars so at all. There are so many things that are disrupting cars. Amazon Fresh is disrupting cars. Now that I get my groceries delivered and my food is delivered, why, why do I need a car? Like I'm down to driving my car less than a thousand miles a year now in San Francisco. It is a lot. Every industry will be disrupted. Every industry. Hi, you, Hi. You, you haven't uh, mentioned the sharing economy in here. Yeah, any thoughts on how that uh, works its way into what your remarks? So I think that, you know certainly the sharing economy is enabled by mobile, right? It lets me know like what's available, when it's available, where it is. It helps me connect with others with whom I may share something. But no, I haven't. Yeah, I think definitely it could be on the list of you know new business models. In living in San Francisco, uh, absolutely, I'm surrounded by it. Bikes, cars, tools, homes, Airbnb, right? You name it. Yeah. 
Okay, Another great. Another question? Anybody else? Yeah, I'd say, you know, if there's no more questions, you know, I'll throw out one final comment. I think, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, and I work with probably 150 or 200 clients a year, and probably one of the things that takes them most off guard is just how expensive this is. You know, I've been in mobile a long, long time, and even just like five years ago, if somebody fell behind in mobile, they could catch up with a few hundred thousand dollars or, you know, a few months, right? And a lot of digital professionals are still thinking about mobile that way. More than half of them probably have less than a million dollars budgeted to spend on mobile. But if you fall behind a day in delivering the kind of experiences that I've described and Jay's described, if you think about those companies that are on the far left-hand side on the customer experience index, you're talking about years and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, if you were to think of companies like Facebook as a mobile company or Uber as a mobile company, those are really, really big dollar values. Um, even if you look at the, like, the new Starbucks app, right, that took them years and probably tens of millions of dollars, if not more, to build. If you were to think about your favorite apps, they probably cost tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of time. This is, this is a really, really big deal. You know, mobile is a catalyst that's going to drive a major digital tra business transformation for all of these big companies that are going to survive. So I'll leave you with that last note. This costs a lot, right? The days of mobile and the cheaper over. How's that? Thank you.